morning. It's good to see each one of you. And thanks for getting up an extra hour early this morning uh, to uh, gather at this hour to continue our series of lessons on uh, This World is Not My Home. And in our previous lessons, uh, we've kind of been creating the groundwork, seeing a pattern in the scriptures uh, of how God relates to his people. And the pattern that we've seen is that God regularly brings his people or leads them into a pilgrim life, living away from home, traveling from one place to another, or brings them into what we might call wilderness experiences where they're separated from the comforts of civilization, uh, and but he does that for a purpose, to develop in them character uh, that he would desire them to have, to place them in a position where they can learn to trust him and develop a history of relying on God and having that trust and reliance confirmed and affirmed by God's own faithfulness, as he proves to his people over and over again, that even though he does lead them into difficult or trying circumstances, he also leads them out, uh, and that his way is always best. So that's kind of the groundwork that we've laid in the previous lessons in this series. And what we'd like to do this morning is look at a very important test case of pilgrimage, and wilderness, and that is the case of Jesus, the Son of God. Uh, and so, uh, let's think about God's Son in the wilderness. We sing a song, I Gave My Life for Thee, and part of the lyrics of that hymn that we sing has these words that are applicable to our thoughts this morning. Uh, the Actually, these words are framed as things being spoken by Jesus. And he says, My Father's house of light, my glory-circled throne, I left for earthly night, for wanderings sad and lone. When Jesus was made for a little while lower than the angels, he underwent a period of pilgrimage far from home, didn't he? In becoming God with us, he, as the scripture said, came to his own, but his own did not receive him. He was born into poverty, sojourned in Bethlehem, and then in Egypt, uh, before settling in Nazareth. And as an adult, he lived the life of a wandering itinerant prophet, moving from village to village, depending primarily on the hospitality and generosity of others for his room and board. And as this song suggests, this is a night and day difference between the life that he led at home in heaven compared to the life that he led in pilgrimage on earth. It's hard to imagine a greater, I don't know, loss <laughs> than the loss of status, comfort, honor, security that Jesus experience when he left a place that is unimaginable in its level of comfort and security and blessing for a level of life on this earth that is actually pretty close to hard for us to imagine what life would have been like um, in Judea two millennia ago, the life of an itinerant prophet in the hillsides of Galilee and Judea. And yet that is the change that Jesus experienced. Why? Well, because he was sent. His heavenly father sent him on this pilgrimage, just as we saw in our previous lessons, God sent his people into the wilderness and on pilgrimage over and over again. And on Jesus' earthly ministry and his life was filled with wilderness experiences. And these are some that we won't discuss in detail. Uh, he went to the wilderness after John was executed, and he fed the 5,000 there. He went to the wilderness before dawn to pray, and went there when the crowds were too great in the cities. He went there to rest, according to Mark chapter 6, and he went there to avoid plots against him, as was recorded 
in John chapter 11. But there's one particular episode of wilderness experience in Jesus' life that we're going to focus this study on for several main reasons. First of all, because it is deeply connected with the wilderness experience of the people of Israel that we spent a lot of time talking about in our previous lessons. And we're going to see the kind of direct textual links between this experience of Jesus and the experience of God's people uh, as was addressed in Deuteronomy in this lesson. But this wilderness episode also is deeply connected with our own experience as Christian pilgrims. Uh, and I am talking about Jesus' temptation. Immediately after he was baptized and his public ministry began, he was led by God into the wilderness. And we can read about this in the Gospels. We're going to look at uh, the record in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, where we read, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days, Forty nights afterwards, he was hungry. Like Israel of old, God's son was tested as God permitted him to experience hunger in a very intense way through forty days of fasting. And this was immediately followed by a series of attacks from Satan himself in the forms of suggestions that were intended to tempt Jesus to violate the will of his father. And we're going to look at each of these temptations in turn and draw the connections between this temptation and we'll see in Jesus' reply the connection to the children of Israel from the Exodus generation uh, and make application as to what the significance of all, how this all fits together. So let's think about the first temptation. Uh, and, uh, and we'll... We pick this up in, uh, in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 4. But really the crucial observation of this portion of our study is that not only did Jesus not use just his own affirmations or statements to combat temptation, but he quoted passages of scripture from the wilderness wandering period of Israelite history. And that's not a coincidence. Jesus was in a wilderness wandering period of his own, and by in the way that he responded to the temptations of his wilderness wandering period, he showed that the lessons that Israel learned in their wilderness wandering were exactly what he needed to address and overcome the temptations that he experienced in his own wilderness wandering period. And the suggestion is, and the conclusion that we'll draw, is we need those same lessons to face our own temptations in our pilgrimage. And that's kind of the point that I'd like for us to think about. All right, so here we have Satan speaking to Jesus after 40 days of fasting. And he came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. <coughs> Satan reminded him, Jesus, if, if you're the Son of God, you can use those divine powers, or you can uh, talk to your Father to uh, provide uh, bread from these rocks and end his physical suffering of hunger. But think about this. When the Israelites were in the wilderness, it was God who led them where he wanted them to go. Remember, we talked about how he led them and how he fed them. And uh, when he was leading them, he would lead them where he intended for them to go, even if that meant a period of hunger or thirst. Well, God had led Jesus into the wilderness as well. And if God wanted Jesus to eat right now, he could have led him to food or commanded the ravens to feed him like he did in one of Elijah's wilderness <laughs> Periods that we talked about yesterday. Or he could have sent an angel to provide a meal for Jesus, like he did in one of Elijah's other wilderness periods. Uh, or he could have just supernaturally, directly uh, eliminated his feeling of hunger. Or uh, otherwise provided in some supernatural way. But God had done none of these things. Yet, as we'll read in the text, the angels will minister to him in the 
very short period of time, but that hasn't happened yet. And while freedom from the discomfort of hunger is not necessary for human life, the words of God and doing His will is necessary for both physical and spiritual life. And so Jesus' reply in verse 4 is to say this, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Uh, and we saw in a previous lesson that this is a direct quote from the book of Deuteronomy, as Moses is trying to drive home to the generation about to enter the promised land the lessons that they needed to learn from that whole weird manna thing, <laughs> how God did provide for their physical food, but he did so in such a way that the, it really mattered whether you believed what God said and did exactly what he told you to as you were collecting the manna and keeping it and, and, uh, and dealing with that very unusual supernatural food. So the bottom line is, if Jesus was the Son of God, he could wait for his Heavenly Father to feed him according to his will and purposes. And since we are children of God, we can do the same. We don't have to compromise with sin in order to provide for our physical needs, like Israel of old and like Jesus in the wilderness. We can trust the Lord because we are the children of God. Remember, Satan said, if you are the Son of God, then you can you know, skip ahead, skip a few steps <laughs> uh, without trusting in him. But since we are the children of God, we don't have to skip ahead. We can wait on the Lord because we trust in Him. Well, the next temptation is rather an unusual one. Uh, cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. Let's keep reading in Matthew 4, verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give your an his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Satan here is asking Jesus to prove he is the Son of God by putting God in the position of having to divinely intervene in order for his purposes in Christ to continue. If Jesus casts himself off the temple, He's naturally going to fall to his death unless God does something supernatural to prevent that. And while that would be a very dramatic way of proving he was the Son of God, uh, this is a twisting of Scripture. Uh, these passages of Scripture were intended to praise God for his acts of divine protection, but Satan has twisted them into a test that somehow the Heavenly Father has to pass in order for Jesus' credentials to be believed in his claims. In reply, uh, Jesus quotes this passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16. Uh, in that passage, Noza said, the full reading is, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. And so the, the context of that, you shall not test or tempt the Lord your God, um, is, Deuteron or is Moses telling the Israelites, do you remember what happened at Massa? And so let's see if we can remember what happened at Massa uh, that uh, led to this reminder from Moses, you shall not tempt or test the Lord your God. And, it, and we'll see that Jesus, this passage that he used in replying to temptation was, was perfect. The story of Massa is told in Exodus chapter 17, where we find the famous account of Moses bringing water from the rock by striking it at the command of God. Read with me Exodus 17, beginning in verse 1. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? Continuing reading. The people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you brought us out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? 
So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They're, they're almost ready to stone me. And the fact of the matter was, God had led the children of Israel to a camping place that had no water. Um, and they're not happy about it. Well, God has a plan. Verse 5, the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel who are going to witness what is about to happen. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you. And there on the rock in Horeb, you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Well, there were two negative attitudes on display uh, at this place, and that's why the place was given two names. Meribah means quarreling. Uh, and so because of their quarreling and grumbling, it's given the name Meribah. Uh, the other was testing, and so that place was also given the name Massa because, as the text explained, there they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord with us or not? That was kind of their challenge or testing of the Lord. And so when Moses later told them, do not tempt the Lord your God, as you tempted him in Massa, he was telling them not to act as though God had to prove that he cared for them by ensuring they never experienced difficulty, pain, or misfortune. Because they, at that time, were asking themselves, is the Lord with us or not? If he were, then obviously we wouldn't have to experience thirst. Something is wrong. And that's a really important question to answer. Is the Lord with you or not? Is the Lord with us or not? And that is, in a very significant way, the question that Satan wanted Jesus to settle. Prove that the Lord is with you by doing what? By te ten tempting or testing the Lord by casting himself from the pinnacle of the temple and forcing God to save him. But if he really was the Son of God, he wouldn't have to ask the question, is the Lord with me or not? Would he? And so he refused to tempt or test the Lord your God. And let me suggest to you, since we are the children of God, we do not have to wonder about whether the Lord is with us or not either. And since we don't have to wonder, we don't have to test or tempt the Lord about that either. Uh, and that is why we also should not tempt or test the Lord our God. Which brings us to the third temptation. Fall down and worship me. Matthew 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you. Serve. Well, in the case of the Israelites, they'd gone on a pilgrimage to acquire the land God had promised them. Uh, and in parallel to that, Jesus went on a pilgrimage to bring into subjection to all the hearts of men. The Israelites were warned not to let the fulfillment of God's blessings cause them to forget the one from whom those blessings had come. And so it's here in Deuteronomy 6, the context of the of the command that Jesus used as a reply to Satan in this case. And these words will sound familiar because we read um, yesterday, the day before, from Deuteronomy chapter 8, in which some very similar thoughts were expressed. But here in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 10, Moses tells the children of Israel, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, 
And when you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. For you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. Jesus was faced with a similar temptation. Satan says, I'll voluntarily give you dominion of the world, Jesus, if you'll just voluntarily offer Satan worship. Would it be expedient or acceptable to accomplish heaven's goals by partnership with heaven's adversaries? Jesus' answer was the same as Moses'. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. There is no purpose of God that can be advanced by forgetting that God is the most important part of every one of his purposes. And that was true for the Israelites, that was true for the Son of God, and it is true for all of God's children. Now, as we view and think about this wilderness experience of Jesus as he was led by God into the wilderness, not only to suffer hunger and thirst, but then to face the onslaught of satanic temptation. It really raises a big, big, big question. Uh, in my mind, maybe you've wondered about this. Why would God subject his son Jesus to temptations like this? Uh, why did God lead Jesus to a place of wandering, deprivation, and temptation? And, and we can ask this, you know, in the case of this specific um, experience in the wilderness and temptation of Satan, but we could also ask, just in general, why he would subject his son to this wilderness and pilgrimage on this earth in general. And I want us next to turn to the writer of Hebrews and give some very fascinating and significant answers to that question. And um, we're going to look at some passages in Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 4, and Hebrews chapter 5, uh, but we're not in that order. <laughs> uh, but so we're going to be looking at several passages from the early chapters of Hebrews because the Hebrew writer brings us to this question over and over again. <laughs> Because the Hebrew writer wants us to realize something very significant that is related to this question of why Jesus experienced what he did on this earth. Uh, and so let's observe, first of all, uh, from, uh, from Hebrews chapter 4, uh, we're told that Jesus experienced suffering and temptation so that he could sympathize with our weaknesses. And so Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 tells us, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus' experience of suffering and temptation equipped him, enabled him to sympathize with what we experience, because he, we're told, was in all points tempted just as we are. And that fact gives us assurance that when we need help, our high priest, Jesus, truly understands. And uh, I, I'm reminded of a comment that Frank Jamerson uh, made a number of years ago about this, and, and his view on this passage was, it's not that that... God couldn't sympathize unless he experienced these things because uh, his, his judgment was that he probably could, but it would be near impossible for human beings to accept that God could sympathize unless they saw their high priest experiencing all of these same things. Uh, and his suffering, either one of these things being the case, had the effect, had the intention of making it so that he could sympathize with our weaknesses, but that's not all. Also so that he could become the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now we're in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, where we're told about Jesus in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears 
to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. It's hard for us to think of Jesus as being anything other than perfect and complete in every respect. But Jesus was not fully equipped for the roles of high priest and savior until, as this passage says, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So God made his son like us and put Jesus through the types of experiences that we share so that him having become like us, we then could become like him. Uh, and so through this experience, he, is, he, he became the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him. Uh, and that's not all. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2 gives another significant list of the, what resulted from Jesus undergoing his pilgrimage and wilderness temptations and his experience here on earth as a human being. Uh, and so let's read that text, Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. It was fitting for him, speaking of Jesus again, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I, I think I said that wrong. It is the heavenly Father who's being spoken of. It is fitting for him to make the captain of their salvation, referring to Jesus, perfect through sufferings. Verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Uh, Jesus was not of the same kind as we were in heaven, but when he was made human in addition to divine, then he was of the same nature as those of us who needed sanctification. Uh, and because of that, then, Jesus, being human, could call us brethren in a true and significant and real way, saying, verse 12, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put his trust in him. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. Here there are Old Testament passages uh, in which uh, the Messiah is identifying himself not only with being a son of God, but being a son of man and having humanity as his brethren and able to identify himself with them. Verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, that's us, he himself likewise shared in the same, that's Jesus, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus could not die unless he had a human life that was capable of dying. But once he became human, he could then die. And that's exactly what he did. And through God's amazing plan of salvation, his death actually destroyed, had the power to destroy death. And the one who had the power of death, Satan. What an amazing truth. Verse 16, For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Uh, he didn't come to make a sacrifice for angelic misdeeds. Otherwise, he would have been had some kind of angelic nature. Instead, he came to deal with human sin. And so he was given a human nature to sacrifice, to turn away the wrath of God as a propitiation. And that last verse says, in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to give aid to those who are tempted. Friends, that's us. We're tempted and stumble. 
he tempted, he was tempted and stood. And that equipped him to be able to make the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Because at the same time Jesus was being equipped to be a merciful and faithful high priest through suffering, his final act of suffering, obedience, and death destroyed the impenetrable barrier that stood between all of God's pilgrims and their permanent heavenly home. So with this discussion of Hebrews in our minds, I'd like for us to just drill down on really just two phrases in these texts that every time I think about them, um, really just make a huge impression on me, and it's is almost shocking. Because the reality of what these verses are telling us is that Jesus could not be everything that God wanted him to be without enduring temptation and suffering. And as I said earlier, we think of Jesus as being perfect, and he was. He was sinlessly perfect. And yet, twice in the text that we just read, we are told that Jesus was not perfect in a very important way. Look at these texts again, Hebrews chapter 5 and Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 7, we're told, though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who <coughs> obeyed him. And in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 10, it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation, referring to Jesus, to make him perfect, how? Through sufferings. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is also able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus was already perfect, sinlessly perfect, before he came to earth. But he was not equipped to be our Savior until he underwent suffering and temptation. These experiences, this wilderness journey on earth, equipped him and perfected him for this new role. The role of the Savior of mankind. This new role. The role of high priest. This new role. The role of the propitiation for the sins of of mankind. He was not equipped for that role, and there was only one way for him to be equipped for that role, for him to be all that God wanted him to be, and more importantly for us, what we needed him to be. The only way for him to take on that role was to experience something that he had never experienced before, and to be something that he had never been before, a human being wandering in the wilderness of this world, experiencing every burden, every temptation that we experience as human beings in this life. And so when he agreed and signed up for that task, that was, it, he was signing up for all of this. And before we move on, Remember, as the Hebrew writer emphasizes in Hebrews 5, verse 7 here, at the beginning of the slide, all of this was though he was a son. He was the beloved son of God. There is no doubt that God, the Heavenly Father, loved Jesus, the Son of God, with infinite love from before eternity. Which brings it to us as we make application. Because we were just told that Jesus learned obedience through suffering, that he could not be all that God intended him to be without experiencing these things. And so my question is if even Jesus, the Son of God, had something to learn and something to be perfected in through suffering, can we learn nothing from suffering? If Jesus was perfected by being tempted and tested as we are, do we get no benefit from it? Should we say to God, you know, <laughs> I know some people need uh, suffering and temptation and wilderness experiences to become all that God would have them to be, but I, 
I'm one of the, I guess, what, special children of God that don't need this extra training? Or am I even Jesus? Was in a category where he didn't get some of this training. And we need so much more perfecting than the divine Son of God. There is no way to avoid the conclusion that we need to endure temptation and suffering in order to become all that God wants us to be. And when we do, we are just being like Jesus. And I don't know if this will help you, but it's helped some people that I've talked to. Sometimes when we're suffering, or when the people that we care most about are suffering, we wonder, does God not love us? And that's why he's allowing this trial to come into the life my life or the life of someone that I really care about. And, and see if this helps you at all. Do you have any doubt that God, the Heavenly Father, loved his son Jesus Christ? I mean, twice, yet those words were spoken from heaven. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Um, and yet, God's love for his son um, you know, was permitted some of the worst injustice to happen to that beloved son. And we have no doubt that even on the cross, the Heavenly Father was loving his son, wasn't he? And we also know that God was able to turn that worst injustice that ever happened to anybody the perfect Son of God dying on the cross, God was able to turn that into one of the greatest blessings that ever happened to mankind. And so, Jesus on the cross is our assurance, not just that God loves us because he gave that gift, but that God's love for us is compatible with us experiencing any amount of suffering in this life. Because God has already proved that he loved us at the cross, and that he is able to turn our worst injustices, our worst pains, into something good. Uh, and so we need not wonder and ask, is the Lord with us or not? Or does the Lord love us or not? If we know that he are, we are his, that is already, that question is already answered at the cross. Well, Jesus and God the Heavenly Father, they're not just interested in giving us a list of blessings. God is even more interested in making us a particular kind of people. And so if it was necessary for Jesus to be made perfect through sufferings, we can rest assured that God can make us what he wants us to be, and he will through these same and he wants us to be the kind of people that can endure trials while maintaining our faithfulness to him and accomplishing his purposes. And that's the example that Jesus gave us. And that is the type of character that he is seeking to mold us into. And once we understand the direction <laughs> that our lives are shaping us, that God is using our difficulties and challenges to shape us, then if we can embrace the goal, that God is trying to make us into the type of people that can endure trials while maintaining our faithfulness to Him and not being distracted from the purposes that God has for us, uh, then we can view our tribulations and trials from a heavenly perspective. And that is what Paul is encouraging us to do. And we'll end with this passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, where he tells us, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, and so we have you know, the, the spiritual problem or matter is settled at the cross. We've been justified by faith and we have peace with God through him. Uh, and by faithfully following the footsteps of Jesus, we have our hope the glory of God and, and rejoicing in his presence assured. And with that settled, we can then, according to Paul in verse 3, glory also in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. 
Now hope does not disappoint, being fullness of the love of God, which has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't like passages of Scripture that tell me how to feel. I, I, I guess I'm allowed to not like them as long as I obey them and take them seriously. But when I read a passage like this, I'm reminded of Jesus at the funeral of the widow of Nain, where he walked up to this woman who's just lost her only son, and she's already lost her husband. And do you remember what Jesus said to this woman? I mean, you know, we're supposed to be like Jesus, but not in every way. I would suggest based on this. But you know, remember what he said to her? Don't weep. So those of you who are, you know, the next time you're at a funeral, you want to try uh, you know, that with the person who is grieving over their loved one, don't, don't weep. That's what he commanded her, don't weep. And that's why, that's why I say, you know, sometimes these commands in Scripture that tell us how to feel, I, I get uncomfortable with. But the reason Jesus was able to say to a widow woman, don't weep, was because he was about to raise her son from the dead, and that's exactly what he did. Um, that's pretty amazing to me. He could tell her not to weep because he was about to do the impossible and restore her dead son back to life. Um, but again, you know, what do we do with these passages where the scriptures tell us how we ought to feel? We experience most of our feelings as something that is outside of our control. But the way we get maybe more control in our feelings is to view the facts of our life according to a heavenly perspective. And that's what this passage is telling us to do. Uh, that it's possible to rejoice in tribulation if we realize the, what the outcome of those tribulations will be. Um, if we can endure our tribulations, we will, actually we get this automatically for free just for enduring our tribulations, we get perseverance. And perseverance builds character. And uh, I like uh, the ESV, which has the phrase proven character. And proven character produces hope. How is that? Well, once we have gone through our latest trial, uh, and we are still spiritually with God, and He has seen us through that, we know something we didn't know before, right? Oftentimes we tell we tell ourselves, I, "I can't handle this. I can't take it. I can't stand this anymore." Uh, but the truth is, we are taking it. We have stood. And the fact that we endured the last trial gives us confidence that we can and have withstood that much difficulty. Which gives us confidence that if necessary, with God's help, we can almost certainly endure that much difficulty plus a little more. Because we have proven character. And that gives us hope that we can overcome the next trial. And once we've done that, for long enough with God's help overcoming trials, we kind of get the idea, you know what? I don't think there's anything this life can throw at me that I can't handle with God's help. And when we feel that way, then we get some assurance that we're actually going to not be defeated by this world, but we're going to be victors over this world. And with the attitude of victors, assurance of victory, we can almost even enjoy the battle. And that's the picture that we have here in this text. We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And that hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. Well, that is the lesson this morning. Thank you for your attention. We'll break at this time and until we uh, get to the 3 Thank you for your kind attention.